So um, yesterday uh, we talked about uh, constructing confidence intervals for a sample proportion. Today, um, we're going to talk about the same thing, but we're going to be looking at using the mean as our estimate or our point estimator for the population. Um, and the process is very much the same. Really, the only thing that we have to do differently is calculate the standard error um, differently for um, uh, for this calculation, but we'll we'll walk through it. And um, again, we s we start with the same basic um, uh, basic formula, where we take our point estimate, which will be x bar in this case, because we have a sample, at least one sample, that we can calculate the mean of the sample, and we're trying to create a confidence interval that contains the true population mean. Um, and so we'll start with the sample and then we'll um, add and subtract the product of the critical value times the standard deviation. Um, and since we have a sample, we can, um, we can calculate the standard deviation. However, However, uh, sometimes, sometimes we know um, the um, uh, population standard deviation. And so when we know the population standard deviation, then we're going to use it. Um, we'll, we'll use that, that value to calculate the standard deviation of the statistic. So the thing for us uh, to worry about when we're looking at a confidence interval for population mean, do we know the population standard deviation or not? And if we do know it, then we'll use it here. If we don't know it, then we can always use the sample standard deviation because we, we took the sample, we can calculate the mean, we can calculate the sample. And that'll be really part two and, and most of today's discussion. And the reason I sent you your very own copy of table B. Um, but if you know the, the population standard deviation, then use it. Um, the question is, how do you know the population standard deviation when you don't know the population mean? And I guess that's a question for another day, but, um, really, uh, we'll, we'll start with this and we'll move, we'll move on. Uh, the critical value, um, is still Z star, um, which comes from table A, uh, just like, um, just like we did yesterday. So if, uh, we want a 99% uh, level of confidence, then this is 2.57. If we want 95%, it's 1.96. And um, um, the calculation goes pretty much like we saw um, yesterday. Pretty straightforward. Again, though, we have to double check that the conditions for inference are met. And the only reason I mention this is that the conditions for inference when we have a sampling distribution of X bar are slightly different for um, the normal distribution part. First of all, the data has to come from a random source, a, um, a simple random sample, or a completely randomized design, or stratified sample, blocked design for an experiment. Any of those things uh, meet that requirement. But for determining whether the distribution is normally uh, is normal or not, remember for the sampling distribution of X bar, there are two ways that we can make this um, assumption. A, that the population is normally distributed to begin with, then, then our sampling distribution will be normally distributed. Um, or, if the central limit theorem is met, the terms of the central limit theorem, and basically that is if we have a large enough sample, then regardless of the shape of the population, 
the uh, the sampling distribution will be normally distributed. So we have two ways to know whether our sampling distribution is normal or not. A, the population is normally distributed or B, the, the conditions of the central limit theorem are met. And then the third condition for inference is the 10% condition, that the sample size is less than one-tenth the population size. So you'll always have to keep these things in mind anytime you uh, do this calculation. And if it's in an open response question and you're not told that the conditions for inference are met, you need to show that, okay? Um, my guess is... Um, that that'll be one of the parts of the question. Um, you know, it might say, are the conditions for inference met? And then you've got, it's a it's an outline, one, two, three. Does the data come from a random source? Is the sampling distribution normally shaped? And is the data independent? So those things you'll have to keep in the back of your mind. They're not on a formula sheet, but you'll have to keep them in the back of your mind. And then you can go and, and do these calculations, okay? Um, so um, uh, the next thing we talked about yesterday was choosing a sample size um, if we know a particular margin of error that we're interested in for estimating uh, the population mean. And again, the... Um, um, value um, is, or the process is exactly the same as we went through yesterday. Um, uh, we will perhaps find a reasonable value for um, X bar as the starting point or the uh, standard deviation as the starting point. Or maybe we, you know, maybe we know it from a previous study, something. But uh, for that standard error calculation, we have to be able to get our hands on uh, something that tells us what the uh, standard deviation is going to be. Um, and for, for most of what we're going to be doing, um, this value will either be given to you or there'll be a pretty easy way of figuring it out from, from the data. And I'm, I'm going to give you an example here in just a minute. Um, but the um, Z-score, I'm sorry, the critical value Z-star comes from table A. Uh, if it's 99% or 95%, you probably won't have to look it up. Those values, those values never change, okay? And then um, uh, you'll just take this inequality, the margin of error is greater than or equal to um, um, this um, uh, expression, and um, you'll just rearrange this to solve for n. And so, uh, again, uh, I'll just go through one, uh, one simple example here just to refresh your memory. Um, as to how this how this works. So um, we, <laughs> I think it's pretty interesting that we came up with this example. Of course, I do this example every year, but it's even more important this type this year, I guess. We want to know how much time you're spending on homework um, during a typical week, and we want a 90% confidence level um, with a margin of error of 15 minutes. So we did a pilot study. Um, a pilot study is uh, where you ask uh, a small sample of, of people. Uh, you get somehow you, cr you conduct a survey to generate a little bit of information. And uh, we found out in that pilot study that the standard deviation of time spent is about 154 minutes. So pretty wide, pretty great deal of variation, almost two and a half hours. Um, of uh, uh, deviation or variation there, but that's beside the point. So we want to see, we want a, we want to conduct a survey. We want to ask um, students, we want to have a thorough survey uh, 
uh, with a margin of error of at most 15 minutes. Okay, so um, we just plug in uh, to our governing inequality here. The margin of error is 15 minutes. Uh, Z star comes from table A. Again, you have to look up um, uh, 90 percent confidence level. So you'll go into table A, find the value closest to 0.9, and you see that that gives us a Z score of uh, 1.64. Plug in the standard deviation from the pilot study, and you find out that N has to be greater than or equal to 285. So in this case, you would choose um, 280, at least 286 students to survey. Um, so again, pretty straightforward as long as you can remember this, uh, this inequality um, and uh, just plug in, rearrange for N, and off you go. Um, not, not too much difficulty there. What I want to spend most of our time today uh, talking about is constructing a confidence interval when the standard deviation is unknown. And this is, this is the most real world. Um, if you knew the standard deviation of the population, you probably know the population mean as well, because just think about it. The standard deviation is calculated based on uh, the distance from each of the ob observations from the mean. So when the standard deviation is not known, um, that is the most real world example. So uh, the standard error um, is calculated from that sample mean. You calculate it in an X bar, so you can also calculate the uh, sample standard deviation. And um, so we'll use this standard error in our calculation. However, there's a little um, there's a little trick here. Not really a trick. It's a um, it's a difference that if we don't know the standard deviation of the population, then um, we cannot we cannot use table A. And I'll show you a graph here in just a minute. We can't use the standard normal calculation because um, the, um, we, we don't have, we, we don't have all we need to know to make that standard normal calculation. So fortunately we have, um, a, another distribution that will help us, um, uh, through this calculation and it is, it's called the T distribution. Um, it looks very much like um, the normal, standard normal curve. Uh, it is single peaked and bell shaped, uh, but we'll see in a minute. It is, uh, it has more area in the left and right tail section. And so um, we, uh, we need to be careful about how we, how we use this T distribution. Um, but this, uh, it, the process is pretty much the same, and I'll show you the T table in, in just a minute. Um, but you'll notice that uh, there's a little bit of notation here where T, uh, T star is the critical value for the T n minus 1 distribution. Okay, so uh, what's that all about? Well, the T distribution is based on the number of degrees of freedom in your sample. Well, what's a, what are the degrees of freedom? Um, the degrees of freedom really depend on the number of samples um, that you take in your, in your sample or the sample size. Is it a sample of, of 20 observations or 25 or 50 or 100? Um, and then the degrees of freedom uh, for the T distribution is you take in whatever the sample size is, you take that value in and you subtract one, and that gives you the number of degrees of freedom. Um, and so let's, um, let's take a look at uh, the uh, distribution. Um, 
And you know what? I'm afraid I haven't been sharing my screen. <clears throat> Y'all haven't been seeing this, have you? I've been I've been talking right along. Somebody jump in and say, "Hey Barry, you've uh you've left out the screen here." Um so um, let me go back to the top. Um, the um, standard error, again, we take the sample standard deviation SX because we have the, the, the values from the sample. We can calculate X bar, we can cal calculate SX. And um, uh, from there, we, we use the same general form of the expression. The, the point estimate, estimator for the population mean is going to be X bar. Uh, and then this critical value I was talking about from the T distribution times this standard error, which is the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of N. And we're talking about the degrees of freedom being n minus one, or the number of um, number of samples minus one, uh, and that's what we that's what we look up in Table B. So let me pull up Table B here, and you'll see that uh, just the the shape of Table B is very similar. The shape of the T distribution is um, very similar to the standard normal curve, at least it's represented that way. Um, the couple of things you'll notice about table B from the beginning is that um, the table here gives us the upper tail probability, okay? So um, why do we do that? Well, it, it turns out that in most cases, we're looking for uh, the area in the upper tail section more often than we're looking for the area in the lower tail. Um, but it, we still use the table in exactly the same way. So um, let's just take a look at what we've got here. Down the left-hand column, you no longer have a Z-score. You have degrees of freedom. Um, so, and remember that degrees of freedom is N minus one. So if you do a, um, an experiment, simple random sample with, with 20 observations, then your degrees of freedom is 19. Um, and then, uh, so you determine what your degrees of freedom is. Then you look for the upper tail probability. Now, oddly enough, many times we're still t doing a two-tailed analysis. We want to know, we want to know what's the um, probability in between two uh, two values here for T star. Well, uh, the cool thing about that is, uh, if you look down at the bottom of Table B, um, it kind of helps us. Um, shed some of the confusion. If we want 95% confidence, and we can look at the bottom of the table, and there's the 95% column. If you scroll up, that already has an upper tail probability of 0.25. So the other 2.5% is in the left tail, the lower tail. So if you're not sure which what's the upper tail probability, then just look down at the bottom and read read your scale from the bottom going up. If you want 95% confidence or 99 or 90 or 80, um, these 95 and 99 are certainly the most common, but you might see one that's 90% just to, um, just to tinker with, um, uh, with, you know, making, making sure you know how to use the, the table, I guess. Um, now, the other thing you'll notice as the de degrees of freedom gets larger, pretty soon we're not counting by one anymore. We're counting by tens and then by a hundred and then by a thousand. 
So you might ask me, Barry, what if my sample size is 50? Um, my degrees of freedom would be 49, but there's no 49 here, right? Well, let's just take a look at the values um, where 49 would be. Um, if you had a degrees of freedom of 50, your, your value for a 50% confidence interval would be 0.679, but if it were 40, it's 0.681 to two significant digits. Those are the same value. So if in fact you have um, a sample size of 50, your true degrees of freedom is 49, but you're gonna use 0.679 because after all this is statistics and that's close enough. You remember uh, at the beginning of the year, I, I, I told you close enough was often going to be how we how we end up making our decisions here and and in this case um uh we can get uh we can get close enough using a sample of uh or degrees of freedom of 50 instead of 49 it, it just those two values are so close and and so if in fact you did have um, your a really large sample so that your distribution was in fact completely normally distributed, you can use the z-score right across the bottom here. Um, if you have a thousand degrees of freedom, notice that for a 95% confidence, uh, you're very, 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 very close to that standard normal distribution anyway. So again, this just highlights the the rule of thumb that the more samples you take, the better you are. So how will we use the t-table? I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that in a minute. But what I want to do is now let's let's look at in graphical form what we just saw in the table. So if you look here and this this graph is in your textbook on um, page uh, page 505. So if you want to come back and you want to look at it, the, you, this graph is is in is on page 505. And so what we've got here is the standard normal distribution, which is this purple graph, uh, overlaid with a couple of um, uh, curves from the T distribution. The first one has two degrees of freedom. The second one has nine degrees of freedom. And, and so that means the sample size was a sample size of three for this one and a sample size of 10 for that one. And what you see here is that the T distribution has more area in the tail section, which means it has less area here in the middle. But the important thing to notice is that the, the, the more degrees of freedom you have, the closer and closer you get to uh, the standard normal curve. So that's why the T table, uh, when you get large sample sizes, it doesn't really care whether it's, whether your degrees of freedom is 50 or 49, you're so close to the, to the standard normal curve that it doesn't really matter. It's close enough. Okay, so um, you will, um, uh, the good news is, uh, again, I'm reinforcing that rule of thumb in statistics, the more samples, the better. So the larger the sample size, again, uh, the, the more accuracy we're going to get in our calculation. Okay, so um, if if you want a little bit more information, you can read um, uh, read the description in your textbook on pages four, uh, 503 and 504 about the T distribution. Um, it's, it's, I wish I had more time, we would go through it in more detail. I guess that's the thing. What I'm really trying to do right now is to make sure that we can uh, handle all of the all the calculations you're likely to see. And so,
um, the T distribution now is based on, this is our standardized value from before. And notice we don't know the population standard deviation. So we have to use the best thing we have, which is the standard error, the sample standard deviation divided by uh, the square root of n. And that's what, that's, that's what the T distribution is based on. Now, I will tell you, if you take statistics uh, later on in college and you get a, an old school professor, somebody from my generation or older, uh, table B, they will often refer to the student tables or the student T tables. Um, I, I don't really know why they're called the student T tables, um, but uh, that's what most of my professors call them, the student T tables. And so you might hear me slip and say that I, I try to try to refer to it as the T table or the T distribution or table B. But anyway, um, the T distribution is, is not the standard normal distribution, but if your sample size is large enough, it's darn close to it. Okay. And so um, let's um, let's see how we might um, how we might use that uh, in an example here. And um, here I'm going to walk you through. I'm going to walk you through it step by step. Um, so it's a little bit easier, um, a little bit easier to see. Um, and I, I can I can talk you through it um, a little a little more precisely, precisely as well. Okay, so here we have um, uh, a question which is titled, Can You Spare a Square?, which is the title of a very famous Seinfeld episode. You're, if you're not familiar with it, you should go watch that episode in your spare time. It's pretty funny. But anyway, the, the study here is um, uh, two statistics students uh, wanted to know how absorbent a uh, brand of toilet paper is. Again, it's funny that we're talking about toilet paper at this time in the history of the world. But anyway, we, we are, we're here. So they put uh, a quarter cup of water on a hard surface and counted how many squares it took to completely absorb the water. Uh, and the other thing that's important to note is that they randomly selected their rolls of toilet paper. Um, and so that's important. Uh, how they did that, we don't know, but we're going to take that and run with it when the time comes. Um, and so here are the results from their 18 rolls. So this is 29 squares, 20 squares, 25 squares, et cetera. And we want to come up with the population mean, the, the average number of squares or the mean number of squares needed to absorb a quarter cup of water with 99% confidence. So we want to be really, really, really confident. Okay. So uh, before we, before we uh, construct a confidence interval, we have to talk about uh, the conditions for inference. Um, is, uh, is the data from a random source? Well, yes, it's given. Um, random, um, a, uh, a random or randomized experiment. Okay. Um, I guess this really isn't an experiment. It's more of a study because they're not inducing a, um, uh, a treatment, but anyway, it is given it's randomized. And so we'll say, yep, we meet that one. Okay, is the data from a uh, normal source um, or from a normal shape? Well, we have two, remember we have two, um, two ways to know. Either the population is normal or the central limit a theorem applies. Well, in our case here, in the information we're given, 
We really have no idea if the absorbency of generic toilet paper comes from a normal distribution. Uh, there's nothing given to us here. Christina and Rachel didn't have any information uh, at their fingertips. So um, we really, we really can't say, we can't say that. Well, does the central limit theorem apply? Well, it doesn't because we only have a sample size of 18 and that's not large enough to meet the requirements of the central limit theorem. We need at least 30 samples in order to meet the central limit theorem. Um, so what do, we, what do we do here? Do we just throw up our hands and say, well, we're done? And the answer to that is no. And in fact, I would anticipate this is the type of um, question you're likely to see um, on, on the AP exam uh, because it makes you think a little bit more outside the box. And so what do we do to satisfy this, con this condition of, um, of a normal distribution? Well, we go back to the first thing I told you to do back in the first week of class. When all else fails, draw a picture. Um, that picture is, you know, like I said, it may not be worth a thousand words, but in this case, it's definitely going to be worth five points on the exam. So what's the picture going to look like? Well, I, I took the time when I did this before to draw a dot plot. Um, of the data and I really wish your calculators would would produce a dot pot graphic because it's the fastest way to take these things these 18 data points and get a quick picture is looking at a dot plot but since you you don't have that you might want to in the uh, in the exam you might want to sketch it but again, if you're like me, artwork is not your strong suit, and I always screw up the scale. So um, what can you do? I, I would suggest on the exam, you've got your calculator. Um, just use it, and it, it won't take too much longer than just drawing the sketch. And remember how to do that. You'll go to Stat, and then Edit. And you'll put the data in a list. And I, to save time for today's discussion, I went ahead and put the uh, 18 data points in list three. Um, and um, so uh, what I want to do now is I want to, I want to graph that. I want to see what that picture looks like. And the best thing that we can come up with is a histogram on the calculator. So I'm going to go to stat plots. Um, stat plot one is already turned on. Um, uh, the histogram is already chosen. So the only thing I need to do now is tell it what list, and I want list three. Um, and so now I'm ready, ready to graph, and I need to do a zoom nine to get my graph in the picture here. Okay. So if you want to use the graph the calculator gives you, then that should be good enough. And quite honestly, if you compare, if you compare this graph with the dot plot, they look pretty similar. You've got a tall pole here in the middle. And remember, we can use the trace key to see where these values are. This goes from 20 to 21.8. And then from 21.8 to 23, and then this one is 20, uh, 23.6 to 25. So this gets 24 and 25 where the tall pole is here. And so it looks pretty much like the dot plot. Um, and just as a reminder, you can change this. You can go to the window key and you can set the, um, the scale that you want. Um, uh, you can, let's see, the, the largest value here, uh, let's just make it, um, I don't know, I'll make it 32 and I'll set my scale at two. I don't really know what this is going to look like. Um, so we'll, 
We'll click graph and we'll see. There we go. Um, better do a zoom nine to make sure I'm getting all my data. Uh, I lost it. I want to go to 32. Scale of two. Half again. So now we'll trace. And sure enough, I'm going up by two here. There's 20 to 22, 22 to 24, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so again, this, this histogram doesn't look distinctly different um, from the dot plot. So either way, you can, you can use whichever, whichever method you want, a dot plot. I mean, you could do a stem and leaf plot. There's no no reason that you couldn't do that. Those are pretty simple to calculate. But bottom line is, if you don't, if you don't know um, whether the um, whether the population is normally distributed to begin with, or you don't have enough data that you can say the central limit theorem applies, your only option here, at least our only option in this course is to draw a picture of some sort. And so then we want to ask ourselves um, these three questions. Is there any evidence of a skewed distribution? In other words, um, is, this, is this graph here showing that the data trails off to the left or trails off to the right in one direction? And in this case, there's there all the dots are pretty closely connected. You don't see one sticking way out to the side here. And the same thing is true about the histogram. You know, the data is pretty well bunched together. So I, I would literally just say there is no evidence uh, of a skewed distribution. The other thing I would check for is the thing we always look for in a distribution. Are there any outliers? Well, no, the data is all bunched together here from 20 to 29. Um, so there are um, no apparent outliers. Okay, and then the next question is, is the data reasonably symmetric? And I mean, there's no, there's no shape here that looks, um, it's not like I have a, a, a lot of, you know, tall tent poles over here and tall tent poles over here to show that this would be bimodal or anything crazy like that. And um, you would say, yeah, it's reasonably symmetric. So, <clears throat> On the basis of these three observations, what we're going to say is um, uh, we are going to up here, we're just, well, let me just draw it up here. We're going to say, assume our distribution uh, is uh, normally distributed based on uh, based on what we did below, okay, based on below. And somehow you, you're going to need to describe that to your reader that you checked, you looked at the graph to see if it was skewed. You looked at the outliers to see if there was anything way to the left or way to the right. And you look at the shape and say, is it reasonably symmetric? And yeah, it's reasonably symmetric. So now we're going to say based on that, and that's a long discussion just to say, yeah, we're going to assume that it's reasonably symmetric because we don't have any other choice. These are our only two criteria that are uh, qualitative. In other words, we know for sure. So if we can't meet these two, then we got to draw a picture. If you can eat, meet either one of those two, then don't worry about the picture. Just say, yeah, it's normally distributed because our population is normal or because the central limit theorem applies. Um, and then the third um, <laughs> is, uh, is the 10% condition met. And um, we'll say that 10% um, uh, condition uh, 
is met because uh, n equals 18 is less than uh, the big population of TP available, okay? And again, I guess I have to laugh because if we were to go to the store today, there's really not a big population of TP available. But anyway, uh, for every other year, this, this course has been taught. Uh, this one is definitely true. Okay, so our conditions for inference are met. And quite honestly, the calculation, the calculation is, is really simple. <laughs> After we go through all of that, the calculation is simple. We're going to start with an estimate plus or minus the critical value um, times the standard error, okay? So what's our estimate? Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, one of the good, <coughs> one of the good things about <coughs> uh, putting this data in a list is that we know that uh, sooner or later we're going to need X bar uh, and we're going to need uh, the standard deviation of X. We're going to need that standard sample standard deviation. So a good reason for putting your data in the calculator is so that you can do the one variable stats calculation. Uh, hit the stat button, cursor over to the calculate menu. We want one variable stats. Um, list is list three and I calculate it and uh, from here I get uh, X bar is 24.94 uh, and SX is um, uh, 2.85 nine. Okay. Um, and so um, we'll use that. Um, we'll use that data now when we plug into the calculation. Let me scoot this over here where we can see both of those things. So X bar now is 24.94 plus or minus. Now we got to go to T uh, to the T table. And off to the side, we're going to calculate the degrees of freedom, n minus n minus 1. And n, you remember, is 18. So 18 minus 1, our degrees of freedom is 17. So when we go to the t-table, we're going to be looking for um, a degrees of freedom. And also remember, we want... Uh, 99% confidence. So let's go look at the t-table. Uh, we find um, n equals or degrees of freedom is 17. Um, a 99% uh, confidence means that we want 0 0.05 uh, in or 0 0.05 in each tail. And so I think our value here is going to be, uh, let me just highlight this row so that we can, oops, I want to do this. Why isn't it letting me, uh, I want to highlight this. Well, it's not working today. Well, of course it's not. Okay, never mind. So let's just double check, 99% confidence. This is the column we want. And I want uh, degrees of freedom is 17. So my T, T star is 2.898. So we'll come back. So T star is 2.898, uh, standard deviation is 2.859 divided by the square root of 18. Now remember, this is an easy place to get confused. You just wrote the number 17 over here. 
Um, and a lot of times it's very easy just to be in a hurry and write 17 here. But remember, this is in fact n. It is the number of samples. And um, when you do that calculation, um, you'll find out that the um, um, the interval after you run through those values, the interval is to three decimal places, 23.0 to 26.9. And so um, we, would, we would interpret, we would say um, with 99% confidence, uh, we believe the, the true uh, mean number of, uh, number of squares of toilet paper to absorb a cup of water lies somewhere between 23 and 26.9. Um, and so, um, and we're done. That's, that's what we were after. We were after a confidence interval at the 99% level, and that's the calculation, okay? Um, now, in reality, um, this, this took a while for me to describe, but uh, in reality, um, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't take that long to do when you start up here and you go through, um, go through what you're what you need to do. Now, if you have to draw a picture like I did here, it takes a little bit longer, but you've got plenty of pictures at your disposal. Um, and let me just say, I mean, you can use a histogram from your calculator. You can use a, um, a stem plot. Um, any, any of these or a dot plot, any of these, um, diagrams are more than adequate to answer these questions. Is there any evidence that the data is, comes from a skewed population? Are there any outliers? Is it reasonably symmetric? And if you, if those things, you can rule out that it's skew or they're outliers and you can affirm that it looks reasonably symmetric, then it's okay to go ahead and assume that the distribution comes from a normal uh, from a normal population. Okay. So let me get back to, get back to class here. And um, I'll stop and say, hey, do we have any questions? Anybody got any questions at this point? And I know this is a lot. This is this is drinking water from a fire hose. There's there's a lot here to absorb. No pun intended, but um, there is a lot of information here, and I, I get that. Um, but after we practice this a couple of times, you'll find that it's um, it's pretty straightforward. It, it's it's really not it's really not that bad. Um, so to practice what we just did uh, on page 518 um, of your textbook, uh, question number 63 or exercise 63, give it some gas. Basically the same, same question, uh, the same set of steps. Um, when you read through the case that's presented there, uh, I think you'll conclude uh, I cannot answer the uh, question about normal distribution because the central limit theorem doesn't apply. And I don't know whether fuel efficiency um, in a particular vehicle is normally distributed or not. So you're going to have to come up with a graph of some sort. You draw a histogram, a dot plot, stem plot, um, any of those things. Um, uh, and, and you need to, in the, on the exam, you need to take the time to sketch that. You can't just, uh, you can't just skip over it with a statement of, uh, based on the histogram in my calculator, I think this is not skewed. There are no apparent outliers and it's reasonably 
symmetric. You've got to put a, a diagram or a sketch of some sort on the on the page. And so maybe a stem plot is the fastest and easiest thing to do. Um, I don't know, but um, you need to put some sort of sketch down there. So I'll be looking for that when you uh, when you turn that in. And then from there, you'll you'll need the tea table. Uh, make sure you figure your degrees of freedom correctly and and go from there. Um, again, if you've got questions, uh, feel free to sing out, email, uh, Google Classroom, any of those things are just fine. So um, uh, unless there are no questions, then I will, I'll call it a day. And I know we've been at this almost an hour now, and I, um, but um, tomorrow's class, uh, I think will be quite a bit shorter. Really, I'm just gonna walk us through maybe one or two examples and I think you'll see that we'll we'll be we'll be able to get through them a little more quickly. Um, in fact, what I may do, I may I may start you on a longer problem, and then let you finish it. I, I'm I'm not 100% sure, but we'll see. Um, uh, but this is this is uh, today's the new the end of the new information for the week. Tomorrow we'll just do a practice problem of some sort. Okay. Unless anybody wants to unmute and ask a question, we'll call it a day and um, I'll look forward to uh, seeing you guys tomorrow. Um.